The Royal Horticultural Society have said we are in crisis. The industry is lacking youngsters coming through. This is Eggleston Hall Gardens and over the next 12 months we're going to take you on a journey of what it's like to run a nursery garden. Welcome to Eggleston Hall Gardens. Let's go find the mice. So we have these 30 odd of these boxes which Pepper checks every morning. If there's nothing in them, she'll have a sniff and disappear. Is there one in there, Peppy? Is there one in there? There's a mouse. The little job we got to do since she was young and she had a, a fetish for mice. Not so much a rabbit dog, although she will catch rabbits, but mice all along this wall where we grow our young plants. She'll go from box to box. Because she's lightweight, she doesn't really do much damage to the... Should check both ends out. There's a hole, there's two traps in each box. Well, I need to... Uh... Is there one in there? You want me to look? When you're wandering around 30 odd boxes. You have to uh, bend over an awful lot. Yep. So. Little time saver, aren't you? Little, little back sparer. Our conifers are laid out. These are the laid out. These are our uh, middle sort of range of conifers. We try and keep a, a selection of the rarer, rarer ones rather than the standard things that you get in the garden centres. When you have a nursery like this, we really do have to people have to travel to us we're not like on your doorstep you've got to travel 20 30 miles to come here we're not on any near any major towns or cities i suppose durham is about 30 mile darlington is about 20 so you've got to you've got to travel a long way and if we just do standard things well what's the point it just becomes another garden center i've always had a, a love for hollies madame brio here typical holly leaf um, an aquifolium type lawsoniana 
there's such a range this is a very old variety called flavescens um, and you can see the the golden mottling on the leaves it goes back to the 1600s let's see if we can get really up to get this beautiful things and these young plants have all been potted on Gustifolium myrtifolia, a little shrubby male holly. The long leaves of Lictonthaliae. I'll show you a, a nice uh, specimen of that in a while. It's, one of, it's my favorite holly, the scented holly, the Parado, Ilex Parado. Here, these young grafts are beautiful. When it's in flower, it has the most the scent is like a night scented stock uh, if you want to get posh that's Matthiolo bicornis but night scented stock sounds much nicer an old variety these are young plants of well it's not an old variety it's a, a newer one called amber and the berries are typically amber like on a traffic light here Look at that, that's the chestnut leaf holly. There's just such a range of them and I've always, always had a thing for hollies. Now this is a, a variety called silver lining. It's pretty obvious why it has a, an edge to it. And it was developed, or selected, by a friend of mine from Liss who had a holly nursery. Um, a completely mad woman, it, mad in a nice way. Her name was Louise Bendel Duck. Yeah, Bendel Duck. And she was the most incredible, energetic woman you've ever met. Very wild looking, but, and posh, she was posh. But, you know, she was one of those British horticulture characters. Here is lovely Liz. Did you say an itchy ass? There's nothing quite like Probably scratching an itchy ass. Why are you I'm, filming now? It's one of, that that. One, that one of life's little pleasures. I put that. ants in your pants yesterday. Oh, thank you very much, Clara. So, can you explain to me what's going on here? Thomas. We're uh, we'll repotting some of these amelanchias from these holly bags. It's a one called Ballerina, which is just a quite a nice form of the common snowy mespolus. Um, uh, they've been in these bags for the last couple of years now, so we're just potting them just to give them a bit of fresh compost and some a new leaf to like. Because I mean, you can see they're quite large plants now in these bags, so you can see nice little roots coming out the bottom and really if they stay in the poly bags they're, they're, they're going to get checked aren't they you're not going to yeah yeah if they stay another year they'll get checked and they'll just start getting a bit st stunted i mean it's not a bad thing though mm. blooming good size as they are but yeah it's just to keep them going a bit longer and especially when the problem with the poly bags as well after a couple of years they get brittle as well mm. so they'll probably start flaking away and just tear and stuff somebody wrote to us and wondered if you were brother and sister oh i know that we are we know we're not. <laughs> don't insult me insult you don't, don't insult me <laughs> Thank you Cosmo, what a lovely little robot. We're in with the bulbs at the moment that we did in our, well, late autumn really. Uh, they're all shooting through at the moment. Pick out some nice things. These, yeah. Iris reticulata, they're not far off now. They're gonna be, I think this bit's gonna be the flower, I should think. Um, very pretty, just mini little irises, about that high usually. Yeah, 10 to 15. Very pretty, comes at about at, just after the snow drops. 
fairly easy nice little jobby uh, we've got them in these crates so they're not sat against the ground to give them a bit more um, drainage what else do we have Tete -a -tete. it's one of my favourites. I have a lot of it in my garden. Very early, dwarfy little daffodils. Will go anywhere. I have them in my borders, I shove them in any pots I have. And they're jolly, they cut, and they're easy, they're naturalised. You shove them in and forget about them. Yeah, I would point out that Elizabeth's walking on very slidey ground. She hasn't shit herself or anything like that. It's very slippery and it's downhill here. That's what I think it is. Yeah, that's another of my favourites. Allium Shoe Bertie, I think it's the one I think it is. It comes up and it has this big, like, explosion of flower. This is the, I think this is the ball one. There's two very similar. Yeah. And it goes like this. I have a patch of them at home. And they come up, do their thing, and then I cut them and bring them in the house. And then the dry, the dry flower heads look nice as well. They're another easy shove it in, forget about it, as long as it's not wet. Would look, you wouldn't really plant one. You'd plant a clump, um, but they'd multiply in time. Uh, and they're all just coming away now. There's some crocuses somewhere. Mm. Oh, more daffodils of various descriptions. These look to be crocuses. They're jolly little things. Good for bees, very early. After the, just after the snowdrops have kind of done the stuff. They're another shove in, forget, and that will naturalise. Which is always good. And then there's a few of the more, well, less common. Mascari. Little blue cones there a bit later on in the season. More crocus. Various fritillarias, which are nice things, but can be a bit trickier. Pushkinka, I think it's called the Russian snowdrop. That's a pretty little thing. There's lots of woodlandy pretty things, pushkinkas. We'll just um, we'll show them to to people as and when they develop. We don't put any of them under cover. They're all, they're not forced in any way. They're up here, top of the gardens, a thousand feet above sea level. And they're just left to get on with it. The only thing, as Elizabeth said, is that we provide a good free drain in soil and we give them a little bit of extra drainage by putting them in the crates. And so, try and yeah. keep squirrels out. And try and keep the squirrels out. Bastards. Pheasant. And the pheasants. And the mice. And the rabbits. Stowed out with perennials. All of these pots are waiting for processing. You'll see that a lot of what we show you every week is about potting. It's because we're a nursery, we'll do pots. Lots and lots of pots. And at this time of the year, they all look the bloody same. There is no doubt about that. Helen, up here, that's my posh voice, is doing, what have you got there? Hosta Christmas tree. Christmas tree. It's not a Christmas tree, just for any stupid viewers. It is for, it is a hosta called Christmas tree. I don't know why it's called Christmas tree. You can see she's going down between the buds. We do a lot of raking down. I have nice new ones, but she just has a crappy old rake thing. She prefers an old tool. Come down this side in there. If you could just pop one up mm -hmm. for us, please. Helen's been doing this for about 20 years, so she could do it in her sleep.
That's about the job. Thank you, Helen. And there's nothing much more to it than that. We just uh, process hostas. They can't all be divided. The larger ones can. So we get two plants out of it. And uh, that's it. And uh, they're daylilies. They're called daylilies because they flower for a very day. Not the whole plant, but the individual flowers last about a day. And all we're doing with these, we're not going to divide them. We're just going to rake them down like Helen was doing with the hostas. Tease out the roots. Get rid of some of the older roots. Open up its arse a little bit at the bottom. Give it a good banging. And then we'll put that in a little while into a bigger pot, which I'll come down the other end and do now because I'm going to nick your uh, potting bench and these fucking old costas. There we are. Yeah, Helen just fucked up the camera. She did it in portrait mode, thinking she was taking a portrait. If it happens, you know, it's just one of those things. It's probably an age thing. Um, Hormone. Hormones. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so, so there we are. This is uh, how we do um, the hemerocallus, which is the day that is. We just put them into bigger pots. If this becomes full up, We'll then divide it then because we've got a, a larger clump to divide. But this will give it plenty of space and root room for the for the coming year. In America, hostas like Helen's doing and hemerocallis are very often grown together. They they complement each other, and then you get um, the American hosta and hemerocallis society. They tend to join up. Not that that's of any relevance to anything, but it's something to say. Thank you very much. Yeah, you can fuck off now, Helen. Over to Tommy Tosspop. Thank you, Cosmo. Yeah. I don't know why I'm saying thank you to him. He called me a Tosspop. But anyhow. He's a very incisive little robot, he actually. Is. We're trying to get him to say far worse than that, but he knows not to. <laughs> yeah, they programmed him. He doesn't say rude words. <laughs> well, Are you going to do this video uh, or not? Anyhow. Yeah. You, told, well, you told me to introduce the sodding robot. <laughs> anyhow, so what we've tried this year over the winter, because we've always in winter tended to have problems with growing our ferns, uh, especially in pots, because what tends to happen is they tend to rot. Because a lot of people think ferns like to be permanently wet, like be permanently moist, but in actual fact, they don't. Like when you see ferns in the wild, you often see them in little cracks in walls, particularly as pleniums. They grow somewhere where they might be permanently moist around the roots, but they're not actually wet, if that makes sense. They might be wet in the atmosphere. So what we've tried is just growing them all up here at the base of our wall, just to keep them a bit drier over winter. Because at the end of the day, it's bad to say when you struggle to grow ferns, because a lot of people say, oh, well, how do you struggle to grow ferns? They're just bloody bracken, but they're not. And we like to grow some fancy ferns as well. So, and you see right at the back of the wall, pretty much the entire way down, if not like two thirds down the wall, we've got a double row of ferns right at the back here in all different forms, just so that they're kept a bit drier and have a bit of shade. And to be honest, at the back of the wall here, it's an area that we don't tend to use for anything else in the winter. It's not a lot of good for other things. So I've just tried them at the back here just to give them a bit of a chance in winter and come spring when the new fronds are unfurling, We'll take them down and pop them on, just to keep them going all the way through this coming season. But I think as a trial, it looks like it's worked quite well, really, for them being up here. So hopefully, we're going to have some pretty fantastic ferns for the coming season. I think so. You're looking, looking down there, at, you know, they go on further down there and they're, they're blooming amazing. Because it is, especially notice on a frosty morning like this, how much of a difference the, the wall makes. You can see when you first come in, all the grass down here is white, but nothing on the wall has been frosted at all. It's no. really quite a blessing and it means it's handy for the marines, the agapanthus, and it's 
brilliant for the bulbs as well. It is like a giant storage heater. It's an amazing thing. Go on. Go on, Pat. Go and do something useful. We're just sorting these out. Cleaning all the top off. Getting your fingers in. Don't worry if you tear a few roots, it's got plenty. Like so. Any old leaves. Don't really want them in. Give you a shake. That's all new growth. This is Synthris Stellata, a little woodlandy job that's quite pretty. These these are going to get more exciting. They'll turn blue. Yeah, we'll see those later on in uh, in the spring. Another few weeks. And uh, we'll look at them again, but they're just being processed down to three litre pots. I hope you appreciate I wrote the, put a fire on this morning. Just to keep your asses. There's one in my bottom very nicely, thank you. These are? A Ridgeron. Oh, it's like a poor man's aster. It's a summer aster, well, summer aster, front of border. Yeah. Easy. This one is lavender, purpley colour. Very hardy. Is it? Well, oh, we never seem to kill them. So, like, we're just breaking them in too? Yeah, I'm going to put them, they're into two litres, so I'll pop them into one and a half, I think. Yeah. See what they do. They're not incredibly exciting, but they're a doer. They're probably good for bees and butterflies being a daisy flower. They're yeah. easy, tough, will clump up quite well. This one's crap out in the middle. Crap being like a horse's cultural word. Yeah. You can get into the middle to get the weeds out a bit better when you split them as well. Hmm. That's my best one to show. Is there any new shoots coming here? Yeah. Oh yeah, look at those. Yeah, look there's those. plenty. No. Yeah. Excellent. It's been cold overnight. It's just above the freezing. And it's been raining and it's wet. And we're all stuck in waterproof gear. It keeps coming over snowy, but because we're in uh, high Pennines, the, the weather can change within a, a mile or two. So when you come over the top to the nursery, it can be absolutely snowy or covered. But in the village where I live, the village of Barningham, there is, uh, there might be nothing. Ah, uh, well, that's life. But the water runs here. As I've said before, we, we're on two slopes. And when you have um, lots of beds, mypex, mypex is the, the woven material. Uh, that we put on the beds to keep the weed growth down the uh, the water floods off of them so we have to have as good a drainage system as we can to take it away it doesn't always work now you get a blockage and it causes uh, oh, just unpleasant work and problems But it ain't too bad. The rain has stopped now a bit. Most of the people around here are from uh, farming stock. So uh, you find that they're a lot hardier. Not necessarily tougher, it's just that they're more used to working out in um, 
in weathers because sometimes you have to work. If you live in a town and you're sheltered from the elements, you're not used to it, but people like Thomas here have to sometimes go out and deliver calves or have sheep to look after. Yeah, I'm glad you added the to look after there, because <laughs> if you said to, to have sheep, you get the wrong impression. How many have you got, Thomas? How many your family got? Sheep? Yeah. Uh, the last count, about 1,100. Fucking hell. Hmm? And 312 cows exactly. 312? So, so because people are more used to it, um, they're not so worried about getting soaked. They just put on waterproofs. I'm a bit muddy because uh, every time I like carry compost and everything, I just get really muddy. Yeah. But it's all right as long as I get the job done. But you're a big walker, aren't you, Cara? Walk miles. Yeah, I walk with you also. <laughs> yeah, I know. My ears take a week to recover. Cara can walk, talk, and have a conversation all at the same time. Yes, you can as well. <laughs> So yeah, Ellen, there's certain, I wouldn't say traits, but there's certain, um, I don't know, what's the word? There's certain attitudes people have that, you know, you, you look out, if you're not used to the weather, you look out and you think, oh God, it's raining, I can't go there. Uh, other people, they think, well, wrap up i'm not gonna let it beat us and we can't afford to we can't afford to let the weather bother us because to be you know not unless it's really absolutely pissing down um because it's uh we've got to earn a living and the plants or in thomas's case the animals on this farm they they, they need processing look how lovely a job they've made of these conifers and these trees we're just starting to line them out. Cleaned, repotted. Isn't it nice to see young people taking a pride in what they do? You know, actually thinking for themselves and having the freedom to do it. And I think it's wonderful. Today we have like these modern apprenticeships and I do worry that some people are just using them as a a form of cheap labour. And that'll break the heart of any youngster straight away. They're not stupid. They know when they're being exploited and they feel exploited. Apprenticeships are wonderful, but they're, they're a two-way two um, process. There you go. They're making a lovely job of these trees. Well, anyway, I'm going to get him back for that. So, I've got to learn about the cordial lines and formiums for my treat for my uh, plant test, um, and about the cordial lines, also known as the cabbage tree. Um, they grow upwards like a tree, like so. Um, the bottom leaves um, they sort of just drop off, and then it just grows upwards over years. Develops a trunk. Trunk, yeah. Um, and then the formiums, also known as the New Zealand flax, they grow out of the ground, but not like a trunk, um, just out and have sword-like leaves. And they're both from New Zealand. <laughs> so we've got plenty here, different varieties um, and different colours. Obviously, see green, purple, 
and I hope we can hear me because it's very windy outside <laughs> and rainy. It is. It's pissing down. I'm definitely going to get Cosmo back though. Good for you. He's a cheeky little twat. Right, everybody sitting nicely, nicely. Miss Finn, Miss Pep, Mr. Turk, and the Black Heathen. That's all gone now. Yeah, all gone, all gone, all gone. And here we are again in the midst of another gale. Only this time. Oh. I will not miss all these problems. I'm going to have to try and sort something out with the roof. There's tire slates everywhere. Just uh, another one of those things. <laughs> I thought I'd get a better conversation out your ass. That's what I like to see, Thomas. Managers that leave from the front. Yeah. Not afraid to bloody well get a broom and get their hands dirty. Me and my hoe. That's trusty hoe. Hmm? This, have you, you must have scraped it already, have you? Yeah. Because it looks... Yeah, it Lisa's going to want to... Uh, She's still going to want to pressure wash it, I think. Yeah. Beautiful. But so there's a temporary repair. I'll have to uh, leave it like that until. Uh, I can get Chris Corsa or somebody in to uh, do a professional job. Oh. It's not one thing, it's another. I've learned in life, especially in this business, as soon as you think you're free of something and you've got a clear road ahead, something comes along and bites you in the ass. It's not a massive problem, but it's a problem and you just don't want to. I suppose it's the same throughout life. Oh, bloody hell. I'm going to check around the polytunnels now, see if any of them are ripping. Most of our, a greater part of our viewers come from America. Across the pond. Yeah. Do you know where it is? Yeah. You don't know where America is? Fuck <laughs> me. Um, the one thing that we do want to say, though, is that we're not natural performers. We have our insecurities. Um, we're doing the best we can, and we will try to do these videos. Speak for yourself, I'm perfect. Well, no, no, I was going to say that I'm perfect, actually. He worries about his voice being... I sound common. You sound I common. Do well. You do sound common. Sound yeah. common. I can sound posh, but then I can sound... Sound really... posh, then, go on. Say something posh. 
something posh. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Shut your gob up, then. <laughs> and um, and uh, Clara worries about that she looks fat or skinny or things. Lanky. Well, and lanky. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. I'm a lanky yeah. streak of Six... piss. Oh, hey, hey. <laughs> language. And, um, yeah, that's just it, really. But we will try our best. We'll do whatever we can. Elizabeth's not in this because she's holding the camera. And she's worried about how she looks as well. I don't know why. I'm perfect. I don't worry about nothing, me. Smile, then. <laughs> <laughs> that was creepy. That was <laughs> <laughs>